We stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Groundbreaking moments from Computer Chronicles. I'm Tanya Hall and joining me is Stuart Chaffe, tech media pioneer, CEO and president of Stuart Chaffe Productions and producer and host of Computer Chronicles. Welcome Stuart. Hi Tanya. Welcome and we're certainly honored to have you here. Not, not long after this thing called cable TV became a common household feature, <laughs> you hosted a show called Computer Chronicles. What's the backstory on that? Well, the backstory is kind of interesting and way too long for what the time you have, but I'll try to make it really brief. Back in the early 80s, I was a would-be geek, and it was very hard to find support at that time. There were very no computer magazines, no TV shows, obviously, no internet, no nothing. And I wanted to find out more about how all this stuff worked. So happened at the time I was running a television station in the Silicon Valley and thought, wait a minute, I've got a TV station. I should use that. I went to a users group meeting and there were 12 guys sitting around in the garage somewhere. And said, there should be 12,000 people at this meeting. It's great stuff. So I'm going to start a show on TV that is a users group meeting. And that's exactly what we did. And we went from 12 people to 12,000 to 120,000 to 1 million and it just took off. But it was really, it was very selfish. I wanted to find out stuff and that was the only way I could do it and be in control. And be in control. I know we talked about that. So. <laughs> So what were some of the breakthrough products and technologies that you introduced on the show? Well, you name it. I mean, we went for 20 years from the early 80s to the early 2000s. There's some real, I really enjoy doing something like this right now because we started out with trying to do a speech, use speech synthesis and speech recognition, which never worked for 20 years. So I, th I see things like Alexa now and Siri and I say, wow, the world has changed. So certainly interface stuff, but I mean, virtually everything you can think of we take for granted today, we bravely introduced. Remember our show was live on tape. This is all new stuff and half the time it didn't work. And so we, people thought we were crazy doing a live demonstration of new products that being shown for the first time. But it was exciting. I mean, you never knew what was gonna happen and we had some real screw ups, uh, some weird things happened. But basically any technology you can think of that came out of the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, we either introduced or had as a guest the guy who founded the stuff or the CEO of the company. Uh, our game was not for me to be the so-called expert, for me to find people who really were the experts and who knew what they were talking about. What we learned actually, kind of an interesting side note, is that the CEOs were usually the last person who actually knew what they were talking about. Um, we would you know, normally try to again get the CEO of a new company, bring him into the studio and have him do a demonstration. And usually what happened, there was some little geek in the corner sitting underneath the table, press F2. Yeah. So, so we learned who really knew what was going on in the Valley. What was the biggest maybe technology success for which you had no initial hope that it would succeed? Uh, actually, what we see today, what I mentioned earlier, is speech recognition and speech syn syn synthesis. That stuff never worked for 20 years. Uh, certainly the internet, uh, certainly mobile. Uh, the stuff was so primitive when we first showed it on the air. And we, you know, for years, we, every year we do another show on speech. We'd never do another show on um, internet or you know, CompuServe at the time or, or <clears throat> bulletin boards. And it took a long time for this stuff to really mature. And it's really the last couple of years. And I was very interested always in interface. It's just that the keyboard was a ridiculous idea for computers. And finally, 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 we got rid of the keyboard by and large. And the other thing I think, virtual reality, we were very early into virtual reality. Everybody thought it was a crazy idea. And it was a crazy idea to try to do a TV show on VR. But 20, 25 years ago, we were playing around with VR and I thought this has great potential. And of course it does and it's realized it. Who are some of the, the guests that we would still recognize today? Well, we had a couple of inter interesting, on the software side, one of our guests was Peter Norton. Probably people know Peter Norton, right? Peter Norton's first claim to fame, which really started his company, was a, a, an application called Unerase, which told people that actually when you deleted something on your computer, you didn't really delete it, he just deleted the address. And so Peter figured out how you could recreate, unerase, un unerase things you had deleted. 
Well, it sounds pretty simple these days, but he came in the studio. He said, watch this. I'm going to wipe this hard drive clean, and I'm going to bring it all back. And he wiped it all clean, and he couldn't bring it back. And there was sweat pouring down his, his, his forehead there. And I can do it. I know I can do it. I know I can do it. And eventually, eventually, he fixed it. We had the John Dvorak on the show who was introducing the PS2, the IBM PS2. That was the modular room. Remember, you take it apart and put it back together like a Lego set? He said, now watch this. I'm going to take this computer completely apart. I'm going to put it back together. We took it completely apart, and then he didn't know where the modules went. And again, sweat pouring down John Dvorak. And I know I can do it. I know I can do it. And eventually, he figured it out. So we had lots of near disasters. Uh, one of the classic ones, we introduced the very first color laser printer on the show by Xerox. I figured it'd be a printer, right? It was the size of two Volkswagens. We had to like take the doors off the studio to get this thing inside. And I took them, there were three engineers there. It took them like three hours to get this thing hooked up. And I said, can we test it now? Yeah, let's test it. Went to the print button, hit the print button, and smoke came out of this printer. No output, smoke. I said, look, we've got to make it get this thing to work. Uh, finally, another hour later, they pressed the button. And so the most gorgeous color output I'd ever seen in my life on the computer. So it was from the very bottom of the pit to the very top of the mountain. John C. Uh, Dvorak is still podcasting today. Yes, of uh, course. If you catch his radio show. Um, right. How did, how did the show shape or maybe even influence tech, the technology market of the time? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, at the, when we started the show, I mean, computers were a weird thing. I mean, very few people actually had computers or had any sort of personal electronic device. I think it showed people that there was some value. When we first started, but who needs a computer? I think there was a famous quote from, when, I remember who the guy was like, who, who needs a personal computer? It's a useless device. And of course, everybody needs a personal computer in one form or another today. So I think just overcoming the fear and, you know, personal computers were really complicated to use in the early days. You had boards you had to install and you had dip switches you had to play with. Of course, it's pretty complicated today too. Just getting this microphone working today was a challenge. But at that time, it was really complicated to do so. People were afraid of computers. They didn't want to, especially older people, they don't want to be embarrassed in front of their teenage kids, show them they didn't know what the hell they were doing. So I think overcoming the fear that people had of personal technology was probably the greatest achievement, bringing it into the home, putting it on TV, making it sort of seem normal. And I really think it furthered the, the adaption, adoption of personal computers. And it was a time, again, remember, when you really needed help. I remember the time I was interviewing the guy who was editor-in-chief of Macworld. I can't remember his name right now. And he said, you know, in a couple of years, they're not going to need us. When computers become like refrigerators. Who needs us anymore? You just open the door. And he was right. So on that topic, yeah, what event or, or product even caused you to realize that personal computing would eventually have a broad consumer, consumer appeal? Um, spreadsheets, of course. Yeah, I mean, what, what was the first one? I had actually still have the original copy of, um, uh, what was before Lotus 1, 2, 3? The really first spreadsheet software on Apple II. Name escapes me right now. Anyhow, spreadsheets is the answer. I mean, that was such a powerful tool a piece of software that lets you do things you simply could not do before. The other thing I think was spectacular is games. Games took you into a world that you could never enter before. And I, I was just a game nut because it was another world out there. I remember going online, CompuServe, for the very first time, way back when, and I was actually just exploring the notion somewhere. Like, this is incredible what I can do, which I could never do in real life. So I think games, of course, loads of VR and stuff like that. Um, and practical things like spreadsheets, put it over the top. What was your favorite game, Stuart? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I was a big fan of Lemmings. One of my favorite all-time games. One of my favorite games which doesn't exist anymore in any real form, it's called Robot Wars. There's a thing called Robot Wars today, but it's not the same thing. Robot Wars was a robot war game, but you didn't fight and shoot. You programmed your robot. So it was a battle between the software and the robot you designed and the robot the other guy designed. It was brilliant. I love playing that. It was really not even a game. 
it was really an educational project. How do you outsmart the other programmer by making a smarter robot that knows when to duck and knows when to shoot? Great, great game. Doesn't exist anymore. I, the world has gone past that. I mean, now you got to kill people in every game like that. This was before you killed people. This is when you actually outsmarted people. Well, you know, I have to admit that I use Lotus Notes. So, I mean, I'm going to date <laughs> myself a little bit there. So was the, was the spreadsheet software uh, Visicalic? Was I'm sorry, was it? Was it Visicalic? Uh, Visicalic, got it, Visicalic. That was was that, that the one? Mine. Visicalic okay. came out of that, and I still have that, I, precious. I have that original five and a quarter inch disc. Wow. Yeah, and I'm very exciting. Of course, I actually knew the guy who wrote it, and he came on the show and actually introduced this notion of a spreadsheet. And I immediately said, this is power. I can do stuff other guys can't do. And of course, it, it worked. Of course, there were lots of competition. And eventually, Excel took over. But during that period of time between VisiCalc and Excel, the exciting time. You certainly had such a broad a range of guests. And it's really interesting to go back and, and look at your shows and see people that we would recognize today early on in their career, uh, the younger versions of themselves with these early on products. As a journalist or as a te in tech journalism, you know, I would look at you and say, you pioneered that, the conversation for, for tech journalism. What, what tech journalism lesson did you learn early on that has stood the test of time? How to speak two languages. The challenge we had on our show was that we talked to the techies or we talked to the newbies because they were both in the audience. And we knew if we talked to the newbies, we'd lose the techies. If we talked to the techies, we'd lose the newbies. So I became kind of like a UN translator. I had to digest really complicated technical stuff and put it in normal English language. So the biggest challenge was making this stuff approachable so that people didn't get scared by it. Again, that was really the issue in the early 80s. People were afraid of computers. They, they thought the computers were smarter than they were. and They didn't want to do that. So I would say that was the most interesting thing to see was how we had to find a way to communicate these two worlds, the geek world and the normal world. And they didn't speak the same language at first. And one of our accomplishments, I think, was to bring those two languages together. Stuart Chaffe, tech media pioneer, CEO and president of Stuart Chaffe Productions and producer and host of Computer Chronicles. Thank you so much for your time, Stuart. If somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way they can do that? Easiest way is my Twitter account, Chaffe at, at Chaffe. That's it. The at sign in Chaffe. Not TikTok, Stuart? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've done a lot of different things. The easiest way, the thing I check every day is my Twitter account. Well, good. We'll, we'll follow you there. If you want to find me at Shafe, that's easy. If you can spell the last name. And I would recommend uh, looking up Computer Chronicles on YouTube and maybe just watching all the old episodes. It's, it's, it's time to be well, One, one to final watch. point, which really sort of answers your earlier question. What really pleases me today is I get emails every day from people who are 80 years old. Said, I remember those days, that was great. And from 16 year olds, I didn't know that stuff. That is so cool. The fact that it crosses that spectrum from 16 to 60, I love it. I do too, Stuart. 16 to 60, what a great way to phrase it. Thanks again for your time. And find more of my interviews right here or at tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.